Amen. Let's take our hymnals this uh, evening. We're going to start by singing hymn number 421. 421, higher ground. Let's sing the first, the second, and the last. Hymn number 421. <laughs> I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on high.
Now, here's a tremendous truth for us. We've been given the word of God, the very sayings of God. And here's what God says that we're not to, or that we are to do. Notice in verse 4, we will not hide them from their children. We're not to hide them from our children. Now, that may seem strange to you, but the fact is we as parents often hide the things of God from our children. You say, how is that so? Because, to be frank with you, we're usually caught up in things that are, have nothing to do with God. We're caught up in the many things of this world. We talk about uh, movies and entertainment and sports and personalities and economics and everything but the words from God's mouth. The conversations in our home are, are all about the things that we want to get, the things that we don't have. How can we attain all of those things? And we're not, we're not giving them over, and so we are hiding them. Notice what else it says. <clears throat> Showing to the generation to come the praises of of the Lord. There should be an ongoing instruction about all the good things that God has done in the past and present. Uh, we're going to pause right there. Let's turn over to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number six, a very uh, familiar text when it comes to families and the Word of God. Deuteronomy, chapter number six. Verse number four Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and, be, and shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Now what does that tell you when you read that? It says that God's word should be an integral part of my home and the life of my family. Not just a few verses maybe read at a dinner table, though that would be helpful but an ongoing discussion and obedience to the living word of God. You know, folks, I'm going to tell you, as a parent, our kids need to see us actively searching the word of God and making application of that word then in our daily lives. Family decisions should be based upon the Bible. School and career choices should be based upon the Bible. Recreational activities, leisure activities should be based upon the Bible. You know what? I'm going to tell you something, parents. Your kids are smart enough to know that the choices that you are making as a parent, whether or not they are lined up with the Word of God or not. They'll understand whether or not you are making a decision based upon the solid foundation as we sang about tonight or on the shifting sands of human reasoning. God has given us his word in verse number five, going back to our text. For he hath established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. At the risk of being redundant, God wants us to be redundant. He wants us to keep his law, his statutes, his precepts before our children and before ourselves. Why? That the generation to come might know them. You know, when I was meditating upon this passage, that really struck me. And I got to wondering whether or not these young people really know the things of God, that they may know them. And I got to ponder, what would... What would happen if there was some strange happening, I don't know, I don't know how we could say it, that took away everyone 25 years of age and older away? Old age disease, it hits us all at 25 and we all die. What would happen to those that were left? Would the young people have enough to be able to survive spiritually. The book of Judges, I'll get you to go back there, chapter number two. Judges, chapter number two.
Beginning in verse 6, And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man into his inheritance to possess the land. Verse 7, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Aris, in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And they forsook the Lord. Well, excuse me, verse 11. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers. So the young people served for a while, but when all of those that had experienced God and knew of his works had witnessed them and been a part of that and learned the commandments of God, when they all passed on, there rose an entire generation that said, we don't know this God. Hmm. You see, that's why God said, going back to our text, he established the testimony, the law commanded that they might make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. So not only... Are we given instruction here to pass on this truth to our children, but pass it off in such a way that they will embrace it, those things of God will become theirs, and that they will go on and pass it on to their children. Now to do this, that means they must not only know these things in their heads, but they must embrace them with their hearts. I'm not going to pass on hard truth, unpopular truth, socially unacceptable truth, if I do not passionate believe it, for myself. So why does God speak here in Psalm 78 so plainly about his word and our need? I want you to look at verse number 7. That they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Notice that phrase, that they might set their hope in God. What thoughts do your, come to your mind when you think of the word hope? We use it a great deal. We say things like, I hope it won't rain tomorrow. Uh, I hope it warms up. Uh, by the way, all of you were just thinking, oh, pastor's going down to California. It was cold. We got to Lancaster. It was pouring rain. I thought, great. I came all this way for what? I think we had about an hour and a half in Palm Springs when we drove down to catch our flight to come home and we just sort of stood outside, oh, okay, this is what we came for and that was it. I hope I get a raise. I hope we have pizza for supper. I hope she says yes. But is that what God intends here in our text? We're going to look at a lot of scripture tonight, so be ready to turn with me. Let's go to Titus, if you would. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. In verse number 13, looking for, there's a lot of verses there that are very familiar, but let's just pick up this verse. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessed hope of our Savior coming, looking for that time. How does that compare with, I hope it won't rain tomorrow? Quite a bit different, isn't it? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's turn over a few other verses. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Verse number 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as Jesus comes. Does this match the, well, I hope I get a raise. 
Now, one hope is simply wishful thinking. The other is a confident expectation. It is a hope that is built upon God himself and can be fully trusted as God himself can be trusted. Now, in those particular verses that we look at, the world may scoff at the second coming of Jesus Christ, but what he has promised, he has promised to return. He said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And what God has said, he will fulfill. That's why it is the blessed hope. Now turn with me to Psalm 119, and I want you to see, first of all, that our hope is founded on the Word of God. Our hope is founded on the Word of God. Psalm 119, longest psalm and longest chapter in the Bible, if you want to call it a chapter, but the longest psalm in the Bible. And we're going to begin um, in verse 43. We're going to look at a number of verses. I'll take you through. They're all... Well, not all of them, but eventually we'll look at one other text, but we're going to be basically in Psalm 119. Verse 43, and take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. Verse 49, remember the word unto my, thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. <clears throat> Verse 74, they that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. Verse 81, my soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Uh, Verse 114, seems odd to say that. Thou art my hiding place and my shield, I hope in thy word. Verse 147, I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried, I hoped in thy word. In thy word. Over and over and over again, we have, we read of one simple concept, I hope in thy word. Now, why is that a good thing to do? Well, first of all, because God's word is inspired. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction in, in, <clears throat> for correction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, I know that we've talked about this in the past, but understand that this book that we have before us tonight and every time that we gathered has the very breath of God in it. It is God in this book. It is God that has spoken. It is God that has given it life. This book is not the product of some inventive minds of ancient history. It was given by God for us as a human race. Jesus said to the disciples in John chapter 6, and I'm going to go ahead and and turn that up. I'm just going to read one verse to you. But John chapter 6 and verse number 63, he said, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Folks, our hope is founded upon the word of God And that word of God is indeed God-breathed. It is inspired. But it is also, it is inerrant. It is inerrant. That is, it is without error in any portion, any idea, any fact, or any truth. Jesus said in his high priestly prayer in John 17, Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth. Psalm uh, 119 and verse, well, we're right there in Psalm 119. says in verse 160, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Psalm 12 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Last September, when uh, my wife and I attended the... uh, Canadian pastors conference as we try to do and support each year Uh, we had a bit of time in the afternoon so we went to the Canadian Mint with Pastor Mrs. Hallmark from Prince George we had a great time going there I I have a picture I was going to try to stick it in the slides of Mrs. Connor holding a a gold bar I don't know they have it there you can lift it's the real thing but it's obviously very much attached uh, to something there but you get to hold this gold bar up and I don't I forget how many hundreds of thousands of dollars it was worth. It was very heavy. But you know, our Canadian mint is very proud. You ever see gold that's identified as being pure, and it's usually 
9999 and that's very very pure gold. Well, you know our Canadian mint is developed a new standard and a new process where we now have 0.99999. It's the purest refining process in all the world and we Canucks did it. That's a good thing. God's word surpasses even the highest standard. You ever read something, maybe it's a bill, I don't know. You ever read something and say to yourself, that can't be right? You ever do that? You know, maybe somebody made a typo or something, you read that and say, that can't be right. When you read the Bible, you know what you have to say? That can't be wrong. Because it can't. It's impossible. It's impossible for God to make an error. His word is the product of his speaking. God cannot lie or be found in error. God's word is inspired. God's word is inerrant. God's word is indestructible. The French philosopher Voltaire was a skeptic who really succeeded in destroying the faith of many people. And he boasted that within 100 years of his death, the Bible would disappear from the face of the earth. Voltaire died in 1728. 100 years have come and gone. The Bible still lives. The irony of the history of that is that 50 years after his death, the Geneva Bible Society actually rented his old home. And they used his printing presses because he was a writer and a publisher. They used his printing presses to print thousands of Bibles. We read this morning in our study, we read Isaiah 40, verse 8, how the word of our Lord shall stand forever. The Lord Jesus said over in Mark's gospel, chapter 13, and verse 31, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. You know, the fact is, you and I will be long gone and forgotten, as we must all eventually do, but the Bible will continue. If God decides to hold off his return and bringing all things to an end, the reality is after I'm gone, after my children are gone, after my grandchildren are gone, after their children are gone, and there are still descendants on that family line, people who maybe will bear the name Connor, you know what? The word of God will be there for them because it is indestructible. You know what else? The word of God is intuitive. Now, my Bible tells me in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, it says, for the word of God is quick, and that's an old English word, but it means alive. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word has a way of reaching into us. The psalmist in Psalm 139 said, search me, O God, and know my heart, and see if there be any wicked way in me. One man said, God has given us the word to study us as we study it. You know, it always uh, amazes me that as I spend time in these sacred pages, that when I quiet my heart to do so, I find that as I read that God does indeed probe my heart and show me things about myself. It's, it's like God's talking to me. And he is. That's why he gave this word. It is intuitive because it knows exactly what we need and will bring that to our attention. You know, if the generation to come is going to have any hope, real hope, they're going to have to set their hope, their confident expectations in God. It must be a hope that is founded upon the word of God. Let's go back to Psalm 78. I would also tell you that our hope is fueled by the works of God. Our hope is fueled, it's built, it's pumped up by the works of God. Now we're going to read a number of different passages. I want to begin in verse number 9. Verse number 9. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forgot his works 
and his wonders that he had showed them. Marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea, caused them to pass through, and he made the waters to stand as a heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. But notice that when they kept not the covenant, they forgot his works, and his wonders. Let's read a little bit further, verse 22. Because they believed not in God and trusted not his salvation, though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food and he sent them meat to the full. Verse number 40. How oft they did provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. How he wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan and turned their rivers into blood and their floods that they could not drink. He sent divers sorts of flies among them which devoured them and frogs which destroyed them. He's talking all about the plagues that were sent upon the nation of Egypt. Hmm. Notice they've remembered not how God had done all those things. And then I want you to turn to Psalm 106, just a few pages over. Verse number 12. They believed, then believed they his words. They sang his praise. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. Notice verse 15. He gave them their request, but sent leanness to their souls. Now, the Bible not only addresses our hearts and our souls directly with the wonderful words of life, but it also is a record of the history of the mighty acts of God in the universe, upon planet Earth, in the lives of his people. And we do well to consider his mighty working. So, what kind of works should we talk about? What kinds of things should we make known to our children? Well, first of all, let's talk about God's propitiation. I know that's a big word, but let's turn to 1 John because that's where we find this word, and I hope that you'll be able to understand it. 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2. We're going to look at another passage in 1 John as well. My little children, verse 1 says, These things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation means a full satisfaction of a debt that is owed. Now let's go over to chapter 4, if you would. 1 John chapter 4. And I'll begin reading in verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Verse 9. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation, same word, propitiation for our sins. The greatest work of all concerning you and I is God's work of satisfying the debt of sin owed by the human race, owed by you and owed by me. Salvation and all that it contains is truly amazing and it gives me a great confident hope for the future and for now to know that I've been truly born again. Let me uh, read to you. I, I'm working on our confession of faith and I've shared that with you, but let me Read uh, just one paragraph from our statement concerning salvation. We believe that an individual who repents and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is saved instantaneously and is made a new creature in Christ. They are forever hence in Christ and are justified, 
forgiven, imputed with Christ's righteousness, regenerated, given eternal life, adopted into the family of God, redeemed, given spiritual gifts, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and eternally secure in their salvation in Jesus Christ. That's only one paragraph. I was going to read all of them, but I thought, well, it'll take us too long. The work of God's propitiation, but also the work of God's presence. You know, when bad things happen to us in life, and they will, we're often tempted, aren't we, to question, where is God? That was the question that Martha, Brother Fury preached about Martha and Mary. And when Jesus, when Lazarus died, remember when the Lord finally came? Now, he had a purpose behind it, why his delay? But when Martha confronted him, she said, why didn't you come? Why weren't you here? You know, my brother would not have died if you had come while he was still sick because we know you have the power to heal him. You know, Moses longed for the presence of God. And, uh, you know, I sometimes think about Moses and his relationship. I'm turning to the book of Exodus, and you can turn with me there, Exodus 33. I told you we'd be looking at a lot of scriptures tonight. Moses longed for the presence of God. I, I think it was a scary thing. They did not... Well, he was given the law during his time of leadership, but there are a lot of things that he did not know and it was all new to him and as God would direct him and instruct him. Exodus 33 and verse 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, and that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this this nation is thy people. And he said, that's God, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not hence." Do you hunger for God's presence in your life? Hmm. In the good times as well as in the bad? See, a lot of times when things are really going south for us and we're being hit by all kinds of discouragement or bad things, boy, we're crying out, God, where are you? God, where are you? God, where are you? (laughs) But when things are sailing along pretty nicely, we're not so concerned about that. And yet there ought to be a hungering and passion in our soul for God's presence all the time. Now, the book of Isaiah gives us some wonderful passages concerning God's promise of his presence. And, and, and let's turn there to Isaiah 41. This is a verse that I know uh, probably some of you have already memorized. Isaiah 41 and verse number 10. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God says, don't fear, for I am with thee. Two chapters over in chapter 43, verse 1. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, for I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Isaiah 46, and verse 4, and even to your old age I am he, even to the whore hairs, that's the white hairs, will I carry you, I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. Hebrews 13, 5, we know so well. The Bible said, Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know, it doesn't matter where I am in the world. It doesn't matter the conditions that I face. God's presence is real in every sense of the word. And that, that fuels, that builds my hope because it's built upon that work of his presence. But I would also suggest the work of God's provision. You know, all of us go through difficult times when maybe finances are not what we would like them to be when we struggle and we wonder if we're ever going to make it and it's when things are tight that we begin to doubt God 
But you know, David said in the Psalms that he had never seen God's people do without bread. Never seen them begging. And of course, we know Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In Matthew chapter 6, the Lord talks about, he said, why are you taking thought for today? Why are you concerned about those things? He said, don't you look at the lilies? They toil, they spin, or they don't toil, they don't spin, and yet nothing is arrayed like them, not even Solomon. He said, the Lord knows all that you have need of. But you know Psalm 37, the one where David talks about that verse where he says that the, he's never seen God's servants begging bread. The verse is just before that. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. Though he shall fall, he shall not be utterly cast out. You see, God's provision goes just beyond food and clothes. He provides, well, I guess his provision reaches to every need that we might have. Now, I shared with you during our annual meeting that my wife and I sold our home, and we've been looking for a new place, which can be rather discouraging. And I have to admit, yesterday when we got home from another round of open houses, which, anyway... It's an interesting experience. I was a bit overwhelmed by the whole exercise. But you know, I had to pause and I had to think for a moment about God and his provision to us down through all of these years that we've lived in the city of Vancouver. You know, I, I believe I can honestly say with no hesitation that every house that I have lived in in the last 35 years has been at the clear direction of God. The very first house we looked at and ended up renting on Jasper Crescent, 7865 Jasper Crescent. We moved, we got this house for $630 a month. I know, some of you are going, whole house, we got it all. Lovely on the south slope down here, down Victoria Drive, looking out over the Fraser Valley. And when we got that house, not too many of you remember that house. Anybody remember that? Mrs. Bowles probably remembers it. Martin, okay. Uh, John Mark does. Smarty. Okay. When we went looking for that house, we moved here. God had called us here to start the church. When we looked, uh, we had looked at that house, and we looked at some other houses, but we kept coming back, and we were praying about what God would have us to do, and and I remember talking to my wife that day. They were asking six fifty. We wanted to pay six hundred. Now you have to understand, we just moved from an Ontario farmhouse where we were only paying three hundred. So that was doubling our rent. So that was a real step of faith for us. And I remember we said, if God will, if they will split the difference, we'll know that it's God's house for us. And so that morning, as we we're getting ready to go out and look for houses again. Uh, the people that own the house, Wendy Tang, phoned me and she said, she said, you know what, we really like for you guys to get this. How about if we split the difference? That was God's provision. And we lived in that house for 12 years. That was a long time until they decided to tear it down and build a big monstrosity on it. By the way, we find this very funny. 7865 Jasper Crescent's for sale right now. And I thought, why don't we go back and buy the house that we started out in? <clears throat> It's just, it's, it, yeah, it's a, it's a different house today, that's for sure. But we thought that would be funny to go back and, who knows, maybe that's the, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> when we moved from that house, we'd lived there 12 years. When we moved, our rent was $830. You say, that's all it was raised in 12 years? Yes. But you know what was so interesting is that when we left, we met Wendy's brother. And he came by the house and, uh, and he said to us, we found out that Wendy's brother was a Christian. And he attended, he attended a Pentecostal church. He said, you know, he said, I've been telling my sister and her husband, who's a doctor, I've been telling them all these years, don't raise your rent, you're a preacher, you're poor. And so he'd been advocating for us for all those years, and our rent never went up, or went up very little over those years. And then I know I've shared the story about how we went looking for a house, uh, and I went out for a day, and I got out, and I looked at all these houses that were for rent, and that rent was going to be about $400 more a month to rent, and so it was going to be a big jump to like $1,200 a month, and I looked at all these dumps, and I just thought, I was really mad. I came home. If we would have had a dog, I would have kicked it, but you know, it was just, I was very frustrated. I was very frustrated, but you know, 
the Lord convicted me that night and just said, are you going to wait on me? And I wait, you know, and I said, Lord, I'm sorry. And so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to put it off. They're not in a rush. They're not kicking us out. And so we, we began to leave it at that. And uh, the very next day, um, my son, Pastor Paul, was playing Little League baseball in those days. And I had come to the church very early in the morning. I had had actually a men's breakfast. I need to start that again. Guys, would you like to have a men's prayer meeting at 6 a.m.? Ooh, I shouldn't have asked that. We had prayer meeting at 6 in the morning. And guys would come before work, and we'd just spend uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, uh, share some things from the Word of God, and have a cup of coffee, and, and everybody head out for work. Well, okay, fall's coming. I'll think about that. But uh, I was hungry. I had come without eating anything. I was still hungry, so I had phone Mrs. Connor, and I said, can I come home and get something to eat, and I'll take Paul to baseball practice. And uh, in those days, uh, I would often use, we had a big 15-passenger Dodge van, and I went home, and I, I picked up Paul, brought him up to the uh, ball practice, and the coach said to me, he said, you know, Mr. Connery, he said, uh, uh, the boys are, were in uh, the, not the finals, I don't know what it was. Anyway, uh, what's the next level up? Provincials. Anyway, he said, then we need to practice on a different field. Would you mind, you got your van here, would you mind taking the boys over to the Diamond? And I said, sure. And it wasn't very far from Vic Drive, it was over by Killarney. So we went over to Killarney, and I dropped all the boys off, and I came on my way back here. And I went down a street that I would never go, never no reason to go. It was a side street, and I turned the corner. As I turned the corner, there was a house sitting there with a big sign in the window for rent. And I just pulled over that van, and I got out, and I went over and peered in the windows. It was early in the morning, so there wasn't anybody there. I wrote down the phone number, and I got to church, and I phoned the man. I said, his name was Victor. I said, Victor, or I didn't know it was Victor, but I said, I was wondering, have you rented your house yet? He said, no, I just put a sign in. I haven't even put it in the paper yet. I'm doing some work on it. I said, do you mind if I come by and look at it? He said, sure. We went by, and we lived in that house for nine years. That's God's provision. And then, of course, we know when that house sold, and many of you were around 15 years ago when we had to, when we, had to we got a chance to buy our first home, and Obviously, the church was very helpful in us getting that, but as we shopped for a home, the home that we now live in was, I think, the second house that we looked at, but when we looked at it, and the people kept dropping the price because they knew I was a priest. <laughs> Catholic family, obviously, and um, uh, they, it, it works, right? Yeah, you know, and uh, by the time we bought it, they had dropped the price $20,000. But I remember, and Hannah will remember, and John Mark will remember, that summer while we were looking and praying and knowing that we had to move and buy a house, uh, West Coast had just come out with their new CD and it had this song on it, God Will Provide. And that became our family theme song that summer. We used to drive around and we kept singing that song and we knew that God would provide. Now, by the way, that's my new favorite song again. <laughs> And we would ask you to keep praying for us. But I want you to know that God always does provide. You know, that's something. That, and if you will stop and think for a moment and meditate for a moment on the works of God, it builds your hope, that confident expectation because of his provision. And lastly, there's God's power. Our God is all-powerful. And that means exactly what it states. Omnipotence is the attribute that belongs only to God. There is no creature or force on earth that is more powerful than the God of this Bible. And time and time again, you know, when people were faced with impossible circumstances, God challenged them with a simple question. Is anything too hard for God? Time and time again. <clears throat> Jeremiah cried out in praise to the God who is omnipotent. The angel Gabriel said to young Mary, he said, for with God nothing is impossible. And the Lord Jesus, before he ascended back into heaven and gathered his disciples together, before he commissioned them, he said, all power is given unto me. You know, I stand amazed at the mighty works of God. And when I know them and when I meditate upon them, they build my confidence, my faith, and they give me a solid foundation upon which to build my hope in God. Now, to be honest with you tonight, there are indeed times when I am fearful for the future. 
You know, it seems each new day there's another news story of more rising persecution against the righteousness of God, another attack on the home, another attack on simple moral balance that God has created. And I wonder how we'll survive, and I wonder how my grandchildren can endure, what will come upon them. And then God the Holy Spirit begins to speak to my heart, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee by the right hand of my righteousness. And you know, I begin to understand my responsibility, and I trust you will embrace it as yours. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he hath commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments. You know, folks, we, we do live in scary days. But God says we're not to fear. We have a hope. And that hope, if it's founded upon the word of God, if it's, if it's encouraged and fueled by the works of God, will be a hope that won't disappoint us. It is a confident expectation that God is God and he is in control and we can trust him even in dark, wicked days. I can't ever watch these kids stand and sing or see them running around our church without wondering what kind of world they're going to face. If God tarries his coming, if he holds off and says, I'm not ready to return just yet, although I think his coming is very soon, I think of the changes that have come in my lifetime. And you say, well, you're old, Pastor. You've been around a long time. I'm not that old. But yeah, I have to think about even the changes that have taken place in the 35 years I've been in Vancouver. Well, I'm not talking about high rises being built and house prices going up or this or that. No, I'm talking about the changes that have gone on in our world that it's just distorted, just, it just doesn't make sense. And we've lost that ability today. God's given us over to reprobate minds. We're not able to think, professing ourselves to become wise, that we're wise, we've become fools. But God says, keep the truth before us all. Keep it in your heart, and keep sharing it with those that you love and those that you care about because when we grasp hold of God and grasp hold of his word, then we can set our hope in him. And boy, how we need his hope.